بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد خاتم النبيين وإمام المرسلين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته الغر الميامين والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا إنك جامع الناس ليوم لا ريب فيه إن الله لا يخلف الميعاد ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد In this evening and tomorrow, insha'Allah, we are going to sum up the adab of uh, mixing with people and the recommendation of withdrawal from society and the balance between them and the best manners for a believer in every state concerning either case. Al Imam Al Ghazali, Rahimahullah, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, devoted one section to this subject Al Uzla, seclusion. Al Uzla, seclusion. I believe it is related to marriage from a social point of view and it is related to our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from every other angle. A lot of good lies in being with people and a lot of evil stems from being with people. Brothers and sisters, although we are here to learn, to study, to improve ourselves, to amend our relationships or plan for better relationships for people who are married and people who are single. But I believe we can never make any achievement or any advancement or any improvement unless we correct our direction to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our journey and we make serious steps. This is why I ask the brothers to make the evening specially spiritual outside the subject of love and marriage. Although still I believe it is not outside. One angle or another, everything is one subject. We should ask ourselves where we stand, where we are, brothers and sisters, in terms of uh, coming to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in terms of obedience to Allah. I don't mean by obedience here, obeying and doing. I mean by obedience here, a state of a slave in which he obeys his master. In everything he orders him to do or not to do and in everything that he does not ask him to do or not to do. This is why every one of us has one of three states Imam al-Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani summed up in Futuh al-Ghayb, the revelations of the unseen, when he says La buddha lil mu'mini fi jami' ahwalihi من ثلاثة أشياء Every believer has three things to do or to follow or to 
embrace أمر يمتثله ونهي يجتنبه وقدر يرضى به a command to obey a prohibition to stay away from and a decree to accept so being a true servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't show itself in uh, just receiving the commands and praying five times a day and saying, I am a servant of Allah, I obey Allah. This is one angle. Second, it doesn't show itself only in avoiding haram and telling, here I am, I am a true servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I avoided everything he prohibited. No. The real mirror which reflects your being a true servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the third one. After doing what you're asked to do and avoiding what you've been warned of is uh, to accept what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does to you in your life in terms of uh, poverty, affluence, in terms of travel, stay, marriage, children, no children, jobs, no jobs, education, degree, losing a family member, losing a parent, losing children, or any other spiritual state you may go through, accepting what comes to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the natural result of the first and the second. When you've done your first and second, as a servant does receiving his commands from his master, he shouldn't care or he shouldn't bother. He shouldn't uh, get worried about what comes to him from his master because he knows his master loves him. He assigned to him a place to stay in, small or large, comfortable or not comfortable, it's not his own business to investigate or check or ask for a change. A slave's job is to obey and do the khidma, the service he's asked to do. He doesn't ask his master whether his master makes him famous or not, speaks of him or tells of him in other homes that my servant is really doing the best jobs I always assign him to do. It's not your job to get worried whether you're known or not. It goes on and on. Your job is to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the obedience won't show itself truly but in the third category. This is why most people who claim to be true servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they come to him with objections. I pray, I fast, I avoid uh, usury, I avoid lying, yet, O oh Allah, make me wealthy. On the condition you make me wealthy. On the condition you send me so and so and so. On the condition you change my state into that state. This is very wrong. You're not in a position to put a condition at all. Especially that he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the all-wise, and you are aware of this. He didn't create us to put loads on us. He honored us with the possibility of obedience or obeying him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, through al-ibadat, to get to know him more and more with his qualities. This is why the best state in which you stand, brother, sister, is uh, not to have a choice of the dunya with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your choice is al-ta'a wal-ibadah. You choose what he chooses for you, what he orders you to do, then you proceed in your life trying to do istikhara according to the recommendation of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, finding the signs of what he loves were to follow so that you may get some light here I should proceed, here I should continue, and then no objection. You don't want 
to struggle for 10 years and then end up losing all your struggle because you didn't understand the signs he put for you from the beginning and you lost all the efforts, all the work. Like people sometimes, they study for four years, for six years, then after all, they don't work in the same profession. They end up doing something different. They move to another area or people do some business for 20 years, then they start all over again from zero after losing all their money. I'm sure you've seen examples of people had they seen the signs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they wouldn't have wasted their efforts, but they insisted, they insisted, this is what we want. Oh Allah, this is what we want. Allah let them follow their own choices. This is why Imam Abu al-Hasan al-Shadili rahimahullahu ta'ala wa radhi insists on this meaning. Have no choice with Allah other than what he ordered you to do. In the hikam which we explained, لا تختار من الأمر شيئا واختر أن لا تختار وفر من ذلك المختار فرارك من كل شيء إلى الله وربك يخلق ما يشاء ويختار ما كان لهم الخيرة لا تختار من الأمر شيئا do not have a choice of anything واختر أن لا تختار if you have to choose choose not to choose وفر من ذلك المختار run away from your choice فرارك من كل شيء as you run away from everything to Allah وربك يخلق ما يشاء ويختار quoting a verse from Al-Quran Al-Kareem and thy Lord creates whatever he wills and he chooses and he is the one who chooses ويختار ما كان لهم الخيرة they have no choice with him this gives a lot of uh, comfort to people finally where do we end up? We end up either blaming ourselves or blaming people around us. When you have a strong belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his wisdom and strong attachment to him as a true servant, whatever comes to you, you receive it as a, a sweet thing, a special treatment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with no difference between sugar and uh, salt. You don't see any difference between uh, bounties and calamities. You don't differentiate because all is coming from him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything that comes from him is beautiful because of the channel, because of the source. Because he is the one who is doing this to you. So you end all complaints. People sometimes insist in their dua for 20 years. I want this, I want this, I want this. It doesn't happen to them. I ask you a question. What is the best way to run the world, at least concerning your own affairs, according to your own will or according to the will of Allah? Definitely according to the will of Allah. You won't claim to know even the best for yourself better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even with the things we ask and we get, a lot of people are deluded by the fact that I asked Allah for this and he gave it to me. So I am of a high rank because my dua is answered. Imam Ibn Ata'illah al-Sakandari rahimahullah ta'ala put a challenge to these people they should start all over again their suluk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of this wrong attitude. كيف يكون دعاؤك اللاحق سببا في عطائه السابق? How would your late dua request be a cause of his earlier giving? Because he didn't decide now to give you upon your dua. If we say so or suggest so by any means, we would be kuffar. Because we would be suggesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't know of our dua, didn't follow up on our needs. This is very wrong and great ignorance on our part. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from pre-eternity decreed and his knowledge encompassed every situation of yours including that you're going to make dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you from pre-eternity he decreed he is going to give you what you're asking for we think that we made dua and our dua was answered so we get happy but Gnostics, men of Allah, they get happy when they make dua and their dua is answered why? They get happy because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them ask for what he decreed. Otherwise, you would be making dua for 20 years for something Allah didn't decree. You will be getting thawab, reward for your dua, according to the sunnah. But there's a huge difference between being happy for making dua and dua is answered, being happy with the answer, or being happy that Allah gave you tawfiq to ask for what he decreed already, not for something else. Because your choice here is the choice of Allah. And that is the top level of futuh, tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for any of his servant. If you look deeply into your relationship, brothers and sisters, in marriage or business, in studies or work, in the masjid or the madrasa, we won't be able to improve if we can't improve our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we cannot differentiate between these subtle spiritual states, these nuances in the meanings, in the various branches of Iman, in the various spiritual states and for those of you who are new to the spiritual journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to this science of Ihsan known as Tasawwuf, Sufism this is Tasawwuf you won't be able to study the difference or your position when making dua and during the state of dua and after dua is answered or when dua is not answered you won't be able to differentiate between the various spiritual state not from fiqh not from hadith not from tafsir it is a science of tasawwuf that tells you how should your spiritual state be in aqidah we study that all comes from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but who and what prepares us for sudden visits of calamities or sudden bestowal of bounties from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to react when receiving something from Allah it is tasawwuf, the science of tasawwuf and the murshid is the one who trains you what to do and how to do a lot of people go to offer condolences to others and they tell the relatives of the deceased person to be patient and they forget about themselves. They should learn how to be patient from them. Their patience might be expressed in various levels, but this is the preparation. Now forget about these people. Death has come to them and they already dealt with it. Enough or not enough, in a perfect way or in an imperfect way, this is different. Now tell me how would you react when death comes around your family members? I wouldn't say God forbid because death is going to come around to your family members. The sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to have the older dying before the younger. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to extend our lives, to extend our parents' lives, to extend our children's lives, and to have the sunnah of this world, the sunnah of this world uh, established. I don't know in uh, Urdu or in other uh, Islamic languages, in Arabic, mothers make the following dua to their children, 
تقبرني تكفني people who know Arabic would laugh now تقبرني you may put me in graves not when they are angry when they treat their children in the best way when they express their love to their children when they request something from their children تقبرني please you may bury me in my grave do this to me تكفني you may wrap me in the coffin do this to me expressing their extreme love to their children a lot of people don't understand the wisdom behind this dua what is this dua this dua means you may live long enough so that i die before you and you bury me which is the sunnah of this world because your mother is older than you how many years she got married 15 16 17 13 people now wait until they finish colleges and they never get married girls because you want to finish colleges and people won't wait and when they wait enough they want a younger girl and they don't uh, they are not to be blamed for this so which is better establishing a muslim family or finishing college for you a young girl I believe from an Islamic Sharia point of view establishing a family protecting your chastity is a prior to finishing college this is why we have this problem of uh, young girls not married I believe the society the Western lifestyle contributed to this and many of us I mean here people working in the field of da'wah are fighting against so-called between brackets Islamic culture giving women the rights of choice to study and so on which is very wrong we need doctors but not all the society should be doctors not all women should be doctors or biologists or pharmacists or we need a few of them yes indeed and we have more than enough one brother from the UK came to Syria he's a dentist he tried to get uh, a residence permit a work residence permit as a dentist they told him we don't need dentists in Syria you wouldn't believe that in a country like Syria considered to be a third world country we have more dentists than probably the US or the UK we don't have a problem of lacking doctors, physicians, dentists, engineers. We have a lot of them. Of course, the question is about the level, about the experience, the expertise, about uh, other uh, stuff, which has to do with the political system. So this is how things are related. We go in a subject, we go back to the original subject, marriage. Our choice is the choice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above every other dunya choice. Do you know that from a sharia point of view, you can never go to study. It's haram to delay your deen studies, fardul ayn. And you cannot go in a college to study any other subject unless you have mastered your fardul ayn which needs probably a year of studies. We go in colleges, we study, and we never check on our spiritual state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We never question our uh, allegiance to Allah, where it comes from. People get married when they are in their honeymoons. Their relationship to each other is better than and prior to their relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sunnah or whatever, they might uh, risk their ibadat, they might uh, compromise uh, some of their Islamic principles because of their attachment to each other. Or it uh, expresses itself sometimes in our love for our children. And this is especially in affluent uh, communities. They don't want their young girls to put on hijab early they want them to enjoy life so 
girls grow up till the age of 10, 12, 15 without putting on hijab. You see the mother putting on hijab, but uh, you look at the daughter, you see this often in the Islamic world. Young girls, the age of 15, 17, 18, walking with their mothers. The mother has hijab on, but the daughter doesn't. Why? Because too much attachment from the mother to the daughter that made her give her the choice. Do whatever you want. Let her show her beauty. She's still young, too young to put on hijab. Why? It's like considering hijab a torture. Hijab is honor, not torture. A great honor, not a source of torture or pain. And this is how we should look at it. And from that angle, I spoke uh, two months ago, approximately, on hijab in one of my Friday speeches. And those of you who are capable of listening to Arabic or reading Arabic, you can pull the speech or download the audio file from this website, nasimalsham.com. Nasimalsham.com. N A S W E M A L S H A M. Nasimalsham.com. I spoke about uh, hijab. Not about the differences between the fuqaha, what to cover and what to uncover, but rather to encourage people to put on hijab, to encourage parents to raise up their daughters with hijab, and to explain the point, the point why a woman has to put on hijab, not a man. Although it is the most perfect adab for a man, to have a head cover. And in some of uh, the rulings in fiqh, like in the Shafi'i Madhab, it is makruh to pray with no head cover, bareheaded, unless you make the intention of tadhallul lillahi tabaraka wa ta'ala, humiliating yourself for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in some extreme cases, uh, men may be asked to cover their faces uh, because if they are source of fitna or attraction in the society, as in the case of Nasr ibn Hajjaj, who was extremely handsome, had a beautiful face, and women used to look at him in the streets of al Medina. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala built this life between men and women on a principle. This principle is a talib wal matloob principle of al-talib wal matloob by al-talib i mean a seeker al matloob is the person who is sought this is life allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in us this gharisa instinct of turning towards each other it's out of his bounty which is prior to what is it the lust that comes first or the divine law that comes first? It is a divine law. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not put the lust in us in order to lead us in this life, but in order to use it for a higher purpose, which is uh, the continuity of the human race until the end of time. That is the higher purpose for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put within us this inclination of one janda towards the other. Imam Ghazali spoke about this and I will read his text inshallah tomorrow in the beginning of the section on marriage. The benefits of marriage are four. One of them and the top of them and the first and the best amongst them is guaranteeing the continuity of the human race. Before lust, before protecting each other's chastity, everything is secondary, comes afterwards. In order to guarantee the continuity of the human race through parents, children, who become parents, children, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in one gender the meaning of seeking 
in the other gender the meaning of being sought. And Allah granted every gender one major quality that suits his state. The gender who is sought, referring to females, to women, Allah put in them haya, fearing embarrassment. They don't like to be embarrassed. Shyness. You speak to a young girl about marriage, she grows a red face. She turns her eyes in the floor and don't mean you speaking to her. Her mother speaking to her about marriage, she does so. Even her mother or her father speaking to her about marriage, she does so. Maybe not any longer. I don't know. But this is why the tacit agreement of a girl who never married before is uh, considered a legal agreement from a Sharia point of view because she would be embarrassed and shy to say yes. وَإِذْنُهَا صُمَاتُهَا As the Prophet says in his uh, hadith, the agreement of uh, a non-married girl who never been married before to a husband proposing to her if she is asked her tacit agreement, her silence is to be considered an agreement. This shyness suits this meaning Women are always sought. One has to ask, the other has to answer. It has to be one of two parties. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the meaning of seeking in men. But put in men, alongside that meaning, the meaning of ghayra, jealousy. So that you propose to a girl, but you don't like anyone else to propose to her after you propose to her. You get married to a girl, you don't want anyone to look at her in uh, a way that is indecent. You don't want anyone to share with you any pleasure that uh, a husband shares with his wife. This ghayra, which disappeared from Western societies because of eating pork. Because of eating pork, the ulama analyzed and studied the natures of animals and the impact of each animal's flesh. And they discovered that uh, eating pork affects this quality of ghayra. In the West here, I don't want to say or describe, uh, you are uh, aware of this and you know it better than me. Unbelievers do not mind going to swimming pools at least with each other's wives, kissing each other's wives and uh, mixing and uh, they don't mind more than this, unfortunately, because of eating pork. One of the experiments Sheikh Muhammad Abdo made when he traveled uh, to France, although I don't agree with many of his fatwas, such as making riba halal, and uh, he was a student of Jamaluddin al-Afghani, who was uh, an active member of Freemasonry, following the New York tradition, then following, I think, Scotland tradition. With his many errors and his uh, opening of the way of the Salafis. But one of the things which uh, struck me when reading about him when he came to France, they asked him why pork is haram, why Muslims don't eat pork. So he arranged for an experiment. He got uh, a sheep, a lamb, male, then got a female and put them together. And they observed them. When they got together, after a number of days, they got a new male sheep in the same barn. The first male didn't allow the second male to approach the female. And there was a big fight. They had to interfere. They 
made the experiment again and again, the first male wouldn't let the second male come close to his female. They made the same experiment with pigs. Even their names uh, are uh, disgusting. <laughs> but has to be explained. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't start the verse with pork, started with لحم الميتة إنما حرم عليكم الميتة والدم ولحم الخنزير إنما حرم عليكم وما قال إنما حرم عليكم الخنزير to make it easy for us preparing ourselves إنما حرم عليكم verily indeed he made forbidden for you الميتة dead animals flesh إنما حرم عليكم الميتة والدم and blood preparing yourself little by little because as you see it now people don't see the ugliness uh, and loathsomeness in dead animals flesh unfortunately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted you to understand that it is haram similarly but put it together first meita second blood anyone imagines blood eating blood or drinking blood or drying it or using it uh, is disgusting then prepared ourselves for lahm al khinzir the flesh of swine so they uh, prepared for him similar conditions for the experiment with pigs they had a male and a female together for a number of days for some time then they tried to have uh, another uh, male getting in the room the first male did not m mind the second male coming and sharing with him his female swine the ulama mentioned this in their books of uh, zoology long time ago so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in main this meaning of ghayra, I don't mean jealousy here as translated in the English language with uh, simply one wife being jealous of the other. This is not the meaning which we are seeking here. We are seeking here al ghayra ala al ird, protecting your honor, protecting your ird, your chastity, the bond between you and your wife. Uh, which is sacred as we may say in Islam because it is built on Sharia this is what we mean by it because it is a ruling from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is why one has to ask the other has to respond although from a Sharia point of view some parents are recommended parents are recommended if they have many girls or if they pick up a good young boy to offer to young men their daughters and uh, we have examples of that in the Sharia. Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu ta'ala offered his uh, daughter Hafsa to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an. And he offered her to another Sahabi, if I remember well, Uthman ibn Affan. He offered her. So uh, Uthman said no. I don't need to get married now. Abu Bakr kept silent. But then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa proposed to Umar's daughter, Sayyidah Hafsa, Umm al-Mu'mineen radiyallahu ta'ala anha. And after the marriage was done, Abu Bakr apologized to Umar. He said to him, I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioning her name. So I couldn't even divulge the secret of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not even by hinting so he kept silent so Umar offered his daughter to some Sahaba from a Sharia point of view it is recommended if you find Talib Ilim if you find a righteous young boy to make hints or offer him your daughter but this is uh, outside the normal circle human beings are uh, created main seek women through Sharia rulings. This is why up till now the relationship between the two sexes is built on 
one is seeking the other is uh, being sought with no righteousness girls prepare themselves for the looks of men although it has come now to a level where women would uh, call men but this is abnormal in western societies and probably in extreme cases in some islamic countries where there is no education at all a girl would throw herself or ask a man unfortunately for vice away from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the normal way allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in us men seeking women and women are sought and they wait until the proposal is made so however brothers and sisters in our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah is the one we seek and we are seekers and he is sought Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ففروا إلى الله run away to Allah I wouldn't say away here even run to Allah I would translate this run to Allah ففروا إلى الله because away from the dunya we mean here away from the dunya but this is for the people who witness the dunya if you're really running to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then you don't see anything else so you're running to him not away from anything else because everything is away from your heart the moment you loved Allah everything is away so you're just journeying to him and there's a huge difference between someone traveling through a road being scared of something running and someone is running to get the goal to get an end and I'm sure you can understand if there is an animal frightening you and you're running you might not know your direction you might stumble on the way but if you're running with the goal in front of you and this is our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are running to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not because we are frightened of the dunya the dunya is in his hand and this is the beautiful way of Imam Abu Hassan al-Shadili rahimahullah and how he put it. He put the following example. If someone is holding a dog through a strap, no matter how the strap, how long the strap is, is letting the dog attack you. Would you busy yourself fighting the dog or in one word shout to the man, take away your dog? It would end all your struggle, all your agony, just to say to the person who is holding the strap of the dog, take away the dog. The same also in our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Consider shaitan like a dog. It's worse. It's worse. Because dogs, animals do not rebel against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaitan rebelled against Allah. Animals do not object to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaitan objected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the unbelievers in whom kal an'ami bal hum adal they are not but like animals yet they are worse than animals and this is the case of the unbelievers a shaitan is uh, the worst of unbelievers in human beings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created one example in which all disobedience was put and in jinn Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created one example in it all disobedience was put in uh, mankind the pharaoh fir'aun in jinn iblis this is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ he didn't say or talk about animals or other things because nothing else in other uh, fields in other domains objected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or challenged him it's only mankind and jinn or jinn and mankind who rebelled against him so he reminded us of the fact of creation and the very raison d'etre as they say in English which is a French phrase cause of being cause of existence the very raison d'etre of uh, us being وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ so he didn't talk about the purpose of creation the very raison d'etre of animals or plants or things or metals or planets or anything else because none of them objected against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
and his will. Imam Abu Hassan al-Shadri says, as shaitan all is in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So instead of fighting with the shaitan or running away from the shaitan or looking back in our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look ahead of you. Turn to him subhanahu wa ta'ala and he'll protect you from the shaitan. Similarly from any other fear or cause of uh, fear. This is the meaning of a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani ar-rajim. I hope you followed on the lectures giving the book of Allah in which I elaborated on a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani ar-rajim for few episodes. I think four episodes probably I elaborated on the meaning of a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani ar-rajim. I seek refuge with Allah. One of these meanings is not to be scared from the shaytan, not to be bothered about the shaytan, not to be frightened from the shaytan, Many not to look back uh, while running away from the shaytan, from don't our you trust past. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Some people suffer just remorse. Some people suffer from remembering images of the past, of the unrighteous past. First of all, you should forget about the past after you have done tawbah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Anadamu tawbah. Remorse is tawbah, but remorse is not a cause of pain to stay with you for the rest of your life. Remorse is a cause of uh, a source of struggle to compensate the ma'asiyah by a better sin. So it is temporary. You need it in the state of tawbah to guarantee that you never come back to commit the same sin and to guarantee that you're going to compensate that sin by better ta'at to invest your time in the best way not to sit and uh, weep, shed tears, cry over the past people who cry over the past they never look at the future they never do anything positive for the future Crying over the past leads you to desperation. Desperation leads either to leaving the whole path or to suicide or to deadly attitudes against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, leaving the deen also, or going back to do the worst of all sins. You don't uh, live in remorse for the rest of your life. You repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, forget about the past. To help you getting rid of the memories of the past, sins, movies you've watched, images would come across your mind, or places you've been to, you pray, then you see the images coming in front of you. In order to compensate or erase these uh, images, you need to fill in your memory by a lot of many new memories. This is why Hajj, Ziyara, Umrah, going to mosques, traveling to the Islamic world, being with sheikhs, help a lot. And this is maybe especially for people who didn't uh, grow in uh, a Muslim righteous family. Because I'm sure people who grow in Muslim families would have the best memories. So to erase bad memories, you need to replace them by many good memories. And the best is uh, when you go to visit Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, try to sit there and remember, remember. So brothers and uh, sisters, our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most important thing in our lives, brothers and sisters. I hope we can uh, give it enough attention give our spiritual state or status enough uh, care. If we give 10% attention, 10% of what we give to the dunya, to the akhirah, we would be much better with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We care about every aspect of our dunya, from food till taxes, uh, from colleges till uh, shopping, and uh, including marriages, picking up spouses, but we don't give enough care and attention to our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope that uh, these moments and these lectures will help us uh, deciding on our journey to Him and defining our way and finding, uh, inshallah, 
all uh, helpers on that uh, journey to him. Alhamdulillah, 